We're going to look at Exodus 32, and this is going to be about how cults are formed, how to create a cult. And Exodus 32, 1 says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. So number one, if you're going to create a cult, forget about the preacher. They forgot about Moses, the preacher. So Moses is way up in the mount trying to get a hold of God. He's up there praying and fasting and trying to get a message to get to the people. Meanwhile, the people are down there and getting backslid. They completely forget about the preacher. They forget what, he, what he's taught them and told them. And they forget about sticking with the old stuff. They forget all the doctrine. And some nut in this life will come along with a new exciting doctrine or gimmick and pull Bible believers and Christians out of their church and ruin them spiritually. They'll say things like baptism isn't for today. Uh, you need to come out of the Baptist church and get in our Bible study. Or they'll say another group on the opposite extreme will say baptism is required for salvation. You're in a wrong church. You need to come to our church and get baptized by one of our elders so you can be saved and go to heaven. Uh, another one will come to them and say, they'll come up to you and say, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name only. You didn't get baptized in Jesus' name only, so you're not saved and you're going to hell. You're in a false church. You need to come out and come join our group. But there's cult leaders going around pulling Bible believers out of their fellowship. And you know that all these cult leaders, they're extreme on something. Maybe it's baptism. Uh, they may say, leave the church building completely. You have these guys that are just so against the church building, and they'll say, leave it, and then come have Bible study at our house. Uh, they'll say the church building is not biblical. You need to worship at home. Uh, they may say uh, these old independent fundamental Baptists are teaching heresy because they're Zionists and they're pre-trib cowards. You need to come join our church. But they pull Bible believers out of their church and then the Bible believers forget what their preacher told them. They completely forget what the preacher said. They say, we want not what has become of him, like the people said about Moses. But just because you don't see what the preacher's doing all the time, doesn't mean he's not getting a hold of God. And there is a lot of things that your pastor does that you don't know about, because you just see him three times a week when he's preaching. But a lot of preparation goes into his sermons. And Exodus 32, 1 says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. So they forgot about the preacher, and they are wanting to make gods. Uh, they forgot the preacher said that there is one God. The Bible teaches one God. Malachi 2.10, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? James 2.19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Uh, the Bible says there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches one God, and they're wanting to make more gods. The Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, Moses didn't preach more than one God to his people. They forgot what he said. When he came to them, he didn't say, All these gods sent me. He talked about one God. But number two, if you're going to create a cult, you need to get a lead man. You done ditched your lead man, you got to have another lead man. And in this case, in Exodus 32, it was Aaron, who was also backslid. But many times today, a cult is started 
by one man and his personality. He may have extra hard preaching, and he may have extra soft preaching. It's mostly one or the other. The cultists are extreme to a fault. Uh, they may be sincere, but they are what the Bible calls novices because they're lifted up with pride. First Timothy 3, 6 says, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And the pride blinds them to the things of God. They are just concerned with their self and self-promotion. Uh, Matthew fifteen fourteen says, Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Anyways, that lead man becomes God, it becomes God to you, and if anyone goes against him, then you have to go against them. And if anyone's doctrine doesn't line up with, with this guy, then you consider yourself excommunicated. And anyone who rebels against him will be embarrassed and humiliated publicly to put others in fear. But in this case, in Exodus 32, the lead man is soft. Aaron has gotten soft and backslid. And Second Peter 2.19 says, While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. So some blind leaders of the blind will make you think it's okay to sin since you are saved by grace and have eternal security. Uh, there are preachers who are what they call ultra grace, and they teach that since you're saved and you have eternal security, you can go do whatever you want to do, and then there's not going to be any consequence. They promise you liberty, but they themselves are the servants of corruption, and they bring you back in bondage. They bring you back into the bondage of the world. They're doing nothing but promising you liberty to bring you back into bondage. They don't understand the grace of God. Uh, Jude 1, four says, For there are certain men crept in unawares. That's what the cult leaders do, creep in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They got a different Jesus Christ. Number three, if you want to create a cult, get your family involved to sacrifice with you. That's how they get formed. You get so many families, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And in Exodus 32 and 3, it says, And unto Aaron said unto them, Bring, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. So these cults like the Westboro Baptist Church will have whole families of minions that are dedicated to this uh, who preach the same damnable doctrines. And if you can get families, then you can get numbers. And pretty soon the kids are raised up under the blind leader of the blind and then they have kids and then their kids have kids. And then you have a group of a bunch of self-righteous, mean, hateful-spirited people who are brought up under this satanic teachings. But here in Exodus 32, the black backslid lead man, Aaron, says to get all your family's golden earrings and bring them to me. And he is going to make the God. Getting earrings from everybody makes everybody be involved. And if you want to create a cult, you have to get your family involved in the worship. And them earrings here are a sign of slavery in the Bible. If you've read Exodus 21.6, it said a slave who decides not to be set free, he will have his ear bored through. So in the Bible, earrings are a sign of slavery. And the fact they are making these gods out of earrings reminds me of how people become slaves to sin in their false gods. And a similar thing happens in the book of Judges, if you've read the book of Judges, chapter 8, 24 through 27, you've read about Gideon, and Gideon, after a victory, he has the people give him the earrings of their prey, and he makes an ephod out of them, and the people of Israel go a-whoring after it, meaning they start committing spiritual adultery with this thing that he made, and, and it says that the False gods became a snare unto them. Uh, false gods are not spoken good of in the Bible. 
it calls them a snare. Uh, number four, if you want to create a cult, claim something else for salvation. Now the lead man, the blind leader of the blind, will tell the people that it isn't Jesus Christ that saves, or he isn't the only things that saves. He isn't the way, the truth, and the life. It's actually something else. That's what they'll say. And look what they say here in Exodus 32, 4. It says, And they, he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, talking about the earrings and things he's making the false god out of. After he had made, he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Instead of giving God Almighty, Jehovah God, the glory for bringing them out of Egypt, they give glory to the false gods. They say, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, crediting the salvation to the false gods. And cults today may claim baptism for salvation. They may claim loyalty to the leader for salvation, membership to their group, or whatever else. Some add works to the gospel by simply saying another man is going to go to hell for not believing what the cult leader says. Or if you... Uh, some cult leaders get jealous of other lead men of groups that aren't cults, and they say, if you follow him, then you're going to hell. If you like him, then you're probably really not saved. They'll say things like that. That's how you know you're dealing with a cult leader. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If a man has come to a point in his life where he believed the gospel, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.1-4 through 4 says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If a man has realized he's a guilty sinner and he believed in that gospel, then he's saved and going to heaven. Whatever he's believing or teaching now uh, does not affect his salvation. The things you do after salvation are a separate issue. So you can't judge a man's salvation by his outward works. So if someone's going around saying he's not saved because he's not believing what I'm teaching, then you know you might be dealing with a cult or this guy is, is forming a cult. But John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What does it take to not perish? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, John fourteen six, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, you don't come to the Father by some uh, cult leader or cult. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, a sign that you're in a cult is they're adding works to salvation. Uh, Hebrews 4.12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ that we are redeemed. And salvation is through Jesus Christ and nothing else. If you want to go to heaven, trust in him. If you want to go to hell, trust in your works or your cult. Or whatever else. Uh, number five, if you want to create a cult, then Christianize it. That is, if you want it to be extra deceptive and extra effective. You have cults that do just crazy stuff, and it just turns people off, and they don't join it. But if you want to be effective and get more people, then pretend to be Christian. Let people uh, associate you with Christianity, like the Mormons and the Catholics. Even Jehovah's Witnesses, people associate that with Christianity or Seventh-day Adventists. And that junk's not Christian. There may be Christians in those groups, but they didn't become a Christian by following their false plans of salvation. Like I said, it's possible for a person to believe the gospel and he's not under a good teacher or he doesn't read the Bible for himself and he gets mixed up in some false teachings and he can be deceived 
Christians can be deceived. That's why Paul says over and over, be not deceived, be not deceived. A Christian can be deceived and in a false uh, cult. Exodus uh, 32, 5 and 6 says, And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. Capital L-O-R-D. So he's calling this a feast of the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So Aaron said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. But this isn't the Lord. It's a false god they have here that they're worshiping. And notice it says they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings to it. They're doing things that people would do to the real God. But they're doing it to a false God. They're trying to make it look like it's right when it's really not. And if you want to start to start a cult, you have to put work into it. You have to make it look like you're right. Make it look like it's Christian. Uh, act like you're doing something for the true God. The cults today have a false God. They have another Jesus. And Second Corinthians eleven four says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you see receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So it talks about another Jesus. So there can be other Jesuses that are false Jesuses that aren't the way, the truth, and the life. And people associate Christians with Catholicism, who has a false Jesus. And when you watch a perverted Hollywood movie, they always have Catholic priests. Uh, they always make it look Catholic. They have somebody going into a confession booth. And any time the world speaks of Christianity, they think Catholicism, uh, who has a false Christ. They think of the Hollywood Jesus who is a watered-down, sissy Jesus, not the same Jesus Christ from the Holy Scriptures. But the people in Exodus offer burnt offerings to their new gods, and most cult members are more zealous than Christians who have the right gospel. You see how they, these people in Exodus 32 are offering burnt offerings to their God. They rose up early in the morning. Many Christians today won't even get up out of bed and do nothing. They're not zealous at all. And... Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're zealous. They go out and try to get people to join their cult. Most Christians don't go out and try to get people to be saved or do anything or have any type of a ministry to do anything to get people saved and to edify the body of Christ. But the cult members, they're energ energized by the devil and they are some busy, wicked people. Uh, Philippians 3.2 talks about evil workers. Not all people that are evil are just lazy and lay around on the couch. Uh, number six, if you want to create a cult, become haughty and become stubborn to the truth. And that's what happened here in Exodus 32. If you look at Exodus 32, 7 through 10, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down. For thy people which, brought us that, which thou broughtest up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, giving the credit for their salvation to another god. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them. And I will make of thee a great nation. So they are stubbed up on God, a stiff-necked people. Have you ever talked about the Bible with a Church of Christ cultist? They are dead set on believing that verses like Romans 16, 16 is talking about their cult. Because it says the churches of Christ. Even though the Bible never mentions the Church of Christ cult in the Bible. You're not going to find the Church of Christ cold in the Bible. The church is the body of Christ, as the Bible said, which is made up of all born-again believers, not made up of a bunch of people who have been baptized by a Church of Christ elder. Uh, thinking that baptism washes your sins away is not salvation. You're not saved by water baptism. There's more than one baptism in the Bible. You have the spirit baptism. 
when you're baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ at salvation, that's the baptism that saves, and it has nothing to do with water. You get in Jesus Christ by believing the gospel, not by being baptized by a Campbellite elder. But they'll use verses about the church, which is the body of Christ, to prove that their Church of Christ cult is biblical. So they're trying to prove their lie with the truth. That's a sneaky way a cult leader deceives people, is that he takes a truth, like they take, take the, the church out of the Bible, and they'll use that truth to teach the lie that they teach in the Church of Christ. But they haven't proved anything. Uh, they're teaching false doctrine, false plan of salvation. And if you try to tell them that, you'll find out quickly how stiff-necked they are, how self-righteous they are. They are more about protecting their belief than they are trying to get people saved. Uh, they would rather a hundred people go to hell than for their belief to be questioned. And if... If, some, if someone is mad about someone getting saved at another church, then that's a good sign they're in a cult. If you have a kid that goes to another church and they get saved there, and then they come and tell you and you get mad, that's a good sign you may be in a cult who's more worried about protecting their belief than they are about the actual souls of the people. I, I know of people personally who have gotten mad because their daughter got saved at another church and not at their church. Uh, they said, why did you get saved there? That's not your church. And she was led by the devil for discouraging that girl after she got saved because she didn't get saved at her church. Uh, that shows she may be in a cult there. Uh, Exodus thirty-two, eleven through 14 says, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? which has brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief that he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and in all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. So right there's proof that God's not done with Israel. If they're going to inherit it forever, we haven't replaced Israel. But you have some people that's teaching that. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto this people. And that's what the preacher needs to do when his people go the wrong way. Get a hold of God for them. Uh, don't run them down. Don't hope that they're going to die. Don't wish them harm and pray for them to, do, to have bad luck or something. Pray God will take it easy on them. Uh, if, if Christians, Bible believers, leave your church and join some cult leader then the first thing you need to do is continue to love them and pray for them. And that's what Moses did. In Exodus thirty-two fifteen, it says, And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. So see, Moses was up there getting something from God for the people. Uh, your pastor, through the week, tries to get something from God to give to you. Just because you see you don't see him working through the week doesn't mean he's only working on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. There's a lot more to it than you, you see. Exodus thirty two seventeen and 18 says, And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is, is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And now this brings us to our next point. If you want to start a cult, then you need to appeal to the flesh. Exodus thirty two eighteen and 19 says, And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, Neither it is the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. 
And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed taut, and he cast the table out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. So Moses was up there fasting and praying, trying to get something from God. The people were down there partying. They were down there with the praise band singing and dancing. And dancing in the Bible is associated with wicked stuff. Uh, Herodias' daughter danced before Herod, and he got full of lust, and it ended with John the Baptist getting his head cut off. Uh, in here, dancing is associated with worshiping a false god. Uh, Lester Roloff said a dancing foot and a praying knee don't grow on the same leg. The cults will appeal to the flesh, maybe through the music and their worship, maybe through making you feel good about yourself. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. So, a cult leader will make you feel good. Or a cult leader will add works to the gospel, and people will... People like when you add works to the gospel because it makes them feel like they're earning salvation their self. And that appeals to the flesh. It's exalting their flesh over the blood of Jesus Christ. They think their flesh uh, living right is more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ. A cult may appeal to the flesh because the cult leader makes you believe it's okay to do what the flesh wants you to do at times. Another, the opposite end of the extreme Romans 8.13 says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. It's funny how these ultra-grace preachers who think we shouldn't even use the word sin, uh, it's funny how they have grace with the world and all these people out living like the devil. They got more grace for them than they do a King James Bible believer who actually believe what the Bible says. They're so nice to the people who are the enemies of the Bible, yet if someone a preacher gets up and talks about sin and not changing the words of God, then they say he's mean and hateful. That's because they have an unclean spirit working through them, and the lying spirit is what's coming out of their mouth. Uh, they have more grace with the world than they do another Christian, and there's something wrong with that. You may be in a cult, when it's like that, there's something wrong there. And one of those ultra soft, ultra grace guys would tell you to stay away from a King James Bible believing pastor who believes that you're going to burn in hell if you don't believe the gospel. There's only one gospel. Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. He's buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, that's the only way to be saved today. You can't get saved outside of that. And... There's something wrong with people who have more grace for the lost world than they do other Christians. And there are churches with sodomite flags on the front of it. But if you was to come and say that's, that's wrong, you're not, the Bible says that the man's not supposed to lie with another man, there's something wrong with them if, they're gonna, if their eyes are going to tear up and they're going to get a, a, mad at you over just telling, telling them what the Bible says. Exodus 32:20 And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Imagine that. Uh, this is exactly what the preacher should do. Uh, take the person's pet sin and hang it over the fire of hell. Uh, Moses took the calf and burned it in the fire. Fire is connected with sin and judgment and hell in the Bible. Uh, get up and t tell them about their sin. Make them feel the fire and smell the smoke of hell. Uh, he took the go God that they made and ground it to powder. Show them that their false gods can be destroyed just like mortal man. Uh, but man couldn't do that to Almighty God. You can't kill the true God. But these all these false gods can be destroyed. They're the work of men's hands. And any false god that's still around at the second coming is going to be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's going to grind them to powder. 
as the Bible says. Uh, now Moses makes the children of Israel drink the grinded up dust of their false god. Uh, they drink Aaron's Kool-Aid and now they have to lick the dust. Uh, when Jesus Christ comes back, he will make them drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured without mixture into the cup of his indignation. You can't drink of the Lord's table and the devil's table. Uh, you stay at the devil's table too long and you'll end up suffering the consequences. The Bible says in Galatians 6, Be not deceived. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Uh, you're going to pay for the bad things that you do. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So there's consequences. Exodus 32, 21 says, And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee, that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Uh, your cult leader is bringing a great sin upon you, just like Aaron did to the children of Israel. Exodus thirty-two, twenty-two and 23 says, And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people, that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. So Moses came down off the mountain. He was as bold as a lion because he had got the power of God on him from fast, praying and fasting. And Aaron is just full of the devil and trying to shift the blame to the children of Israel. Uh, he was left in charge and he blew it. You can't blame others for your sin. Uh, you can't blame not giving the word of God out because of what the people are doing. Uh, he was as much responsible or, or more responsible than they were. Exodus thirty-two twenty-four through 25 says, And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked, unto their shame among their enemies. Notice how dancing is also associated with nakedness and how this cult is associated with nakedness. I've seen a church where everyone comes to church naked. Uh, you, you know, that's not right in the Bible. Nakedness is a sin in the Bible. Habakkuk 2.15 talks about getting your neighbor drunk so you can look on their nakedness. This, a nakedness is associated with drinking alcohol, another sin. Uh, the devil possessed man in the Gospels. After he was saved, he was clothed and in his right mind before he was naked when he was devil possessed. Uh, nakedness is connected with devil possession. And a lot of these cults involve fornication. Maybe the pastor uh, tries to get the women think that it's okay to have multiple wives. And he'll use examples of the Old Testament like Solomon and David and, and deceive the young woman into thinking that it's okay for her to marry him when he already has a wife. And fornication and sexual sin are many times associated with these cults and in some they're even involved in the worship service. Or they'll have things in the worship service that lead to sexual sin outside of the church. Maybe the pastor gets up and says, and I've heard this before, uh, I, don't, I love for the women to breastfeed in my church. And even if they don't cover up, showing some of their nakedness in church, causing a man to look upon another man's wife and lust after her. That's what nakedness does. And the Bible says if you uncover the thigh, you're showing your nakedness. So how many naked people are in your church? Uh, Exodus thirty two, twenty six through twenty eight says Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him, and he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. If you want to find out if something is a cult, then ask who is on the Lord's side. Now most likely they're all going to say that they are. 
Uh, but that's why you got to get out the book and ask that question for yourself. Who is on the Lord's side? Just like they ask here in Exodus 32. Ask these questions. Do they have the right Bible? Do they have the right Jesus? Do they overly divide into damnable heresies? Or do they under-divide into damnable heresies? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed of rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to rightly divide it, not overly divide it or, or underly divide it. But the Bible says there must be heresies among you, and God uses those things to get you to study. God knows that there are some sincere Christians who want the truth. Maybe you're in a cult and you just don't know it. And if you want the truth then ask God to give it to you. Ask God who is on the Lord's side, and He'll lead you to the truth like He did it men in the Bible like Cornelius. He'll send somebody to show you the truth from the King James Bible. And if you are sincerely seeking the truth, then I believe God will bring it to you if you ask Him. Somebody said that there are so many different beliefs and camps and groups and denominations. How do we know which is the right one? You just have to go to the Bible and study for yourself. See which one lines up with the Bible. But there fell that day, in Exodus 32, 3,000 men because they weren't on the Lord's side. And a lot of people will die for their false god or cult. But they will wake up in hell because they rejected God's Son. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Exodus 32.30 says, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and I will, I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Exodus 32, 31, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee, Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. So Moses, the real preacher, his heart was right. He prayed for the people. He cares more about their soul than his own soul. Paul had the same heart. If you look at Romans 9, 3, Paul says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So Paul and Moses would have given their own souls if the people would get saved. And Moses knew they had sinned a great sin against God and would reap what they sowed. But Moses cared more about the people than his own self. Hebrews 11.24 says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Moses cared more about God, getting the word of God and the people than he did his own self and his own fleshly desires. He knew the pleasures of sin only last for a season and he would rather his name be blotted out of the book of life than for the people's name to be blotted out. And that's a true burden for the souls of others. But if you're in a cult, you need to get out of the cult. If you're in sin, then you need to get out of that sin. You need to try your best to live right. If you're not saved, then before you do any of that stuff, you need to get saved. Because you're not going to be able to do it without the Holy Spirit. The first thing you need to do is get a burden for your own soul. The Bible tells us how to be saved. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, Paul gives us the gospel. He tells us how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. The Gospel itself shows you that you're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
if you're not saved, you're ungodly. You haven't been made uh, perfect in your spirit yet. When you get saved, you still have sinful flesh, but there's a side of you that's perfect in the sight of God, and that's how you get to go to heaven. There's a the new man in you is perfect because you you get Christ's righteousness when you believe the gospel. You still have the sin nature because we don't get a new body to the rapture, but there's something in you that God sees as perfect, and that's what's holy, not your flesh. But you're a sinner, and you need to get those sins under the blood. Uh, Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It's the blood that saves, not living a good life. Romans 4, 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So the good things you do aren't going to save you. Uh, Acts 16, 31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The only way you're going to get saved is to come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner you are and believe the gospel. But this has been Exodus chapter 32 on how cults are created.